come to the end of Hebrews chapter 4. So let's open up and take a look at that. And I'm going to read, we're going to study uh, Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, especially tonight, focus on those verses. So let's read that first. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. We want to examine four things tonight, really, drawing this outline from the text, of course. What is the role of the high priest? It's number one. What is meant by passing through when it says he passed through the heavens? I think we need to stop on that phrase and really examine what um, riches are buried in that. And number three, why is it important that this high priest sympathize with our weaknesses? And then finally, what are the two let us commands? What do we do with this knowledge? It's given us two clear commands to let us do two things. So first of all, what is the role of the high priest? The Levitical priesthood in the Old Testament had been preparing the Hebrews for over a thousand years to receive the Messiah. That's probably first and foremost that we should understand about the priesthood is that this was all designed to show us the Messiah. The, the humans who occupied this role and the blood of bulls and goats, it's going to tell us in Hebrews, never took away sin. These were all pictures designed to teach us about the one great sacrifice that would finally take away the sin. But sinful humans and fallen uh, animals from a fallen world could never appease God's wrath or offer a pure, holy, acceptable sacrifice. And yet, God in his mercy offered atonement to the Hebrews for thousands of years if they would follow his prescribed worship through sacrifices. I want to just give a quick overview of the Levitical priesthood and the idea of priesthood in the Old Testament leading up to the coming of the Messiah. So where did it begin? Where did the idea of being a priest even begin? God created Adam and Eve as perfect, complete human beings that had, um, you know, Flawless communication, no, no borders, no boundaries between God. So really we could look at the priesthood as beginning with the fall. It's a, it's, a, it's a symptom and a result of the fall that you need an intermediary to go to God. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, we see God himself ordaining the killing of animals as a mediation. In Genesis 3, 21, he kills, he makes, he makes garments for Adam and Eve out of animal skins. Well, those animals had to die in order for that to happen. And God really institutes the first uh, animal sacrifice as a covering. And I think the idea of covering is extremely important for the priestly sacrifice. We often think about taking away and atoning uh, and, and, and expiating is the word, taking away the sin but also to cover over so that God cannot, does not look upon it. And uh, that was the beginning, in a way, of God ordaining these animal sacrifices. I think the first real proper sacrifice we see made, on behalf of, uh, made, made by humans is in um, Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 through 7. These are Cain and Abel's sacrifices. And we know the story. Cain's sacrifice was not accepted. Abel's was because it says in um, it says in Hebrews actually we're going to see in Hebrews chapter 11 gives us insight into that 
that Abel offered a more acceptable sacrifice. What that was, we don't exactly know. Some have speculated it was the type of animal, the way it was prepared, what was in Abel's heart. It's probably the most likely answer. But um, we don't know why Cain's was rejected, but God gave Cain the chance to do it properly. And say, if you offer the sacrifice rightly, if you do right, will you not be accepted, he says. But if you don't do right, sin is crouching at your door. So he requires that there be, that there be a sacrifice made. Some have speculated even that the reason the Cain sacrifice was not accepted was because there was no blood involved. That's possible. Although offering bloodless sacrifices is also uh, in the Bible. If we skip forward a few chapters, we get Abraham and Melchizedek in Genesis chapter 14, verse 17 through 24. And it says there that Abraham offered sacrifices to Yahweh as a priest himself, but Abraham tithes and he gives a, an offering, a sacrifice to Melchizedek, the king priest. Melchizedek will obviously be very important in the book of Hebrews. We'll look at him in much greater detail in the coming chapters. But start thinking about that now because he's leading into that argument about Melchizedek being the type of priest specifically that, that Christ is, the order of priests that he's in. So we know from Hebrews chapter 7 that Melchizedek is a type of, the, of this greater king priest to come who is Christ, obviously. But Abraham offers sacrifices, and he also offers sacrifices through an intermediary, through Melchizedek, which is pointing all the Hebrews ahead. They, you know, you see the idea developing. There needs to be a covering, so God makes skin. There needs to be a proper way that this is done, so God rejects Cain's sacrifice and accepts Abel's sacrifice. And there needs to be an intermediator. That's not a word. There needs to be a mediator, <laughs> an intermediary, to ultimately... Someone who is qualified to take this sacrifice into the presence of God. And then finally, in Exodus chapter 28, we see the consecration of Aaron and the Levites. These were God's chosen priests uh, set apart ultimately because of the will of God in, in electing them. But uh, we're also told that Levi's, the tribe of Levi's zeal in the golden calf incident was a major factor in, in, uh, in that. And um, they, they defended the righteousness of God in the incident of the golden calf. And they were, the Levites were considered the substitute for the firstborn. So in Numbers chapter 3, God says, the Levites essentially will, be, will take the place of the firstborn of all the tribes because those are mine. We see the idea of substitution the intermediary must be a substitute as well to life for life, you know, to take the life of someone else, to replace that life. The priests in the Old Testament um, do at least seven things. I'm going to emphasize at least, but I was just brainstorming all the different roles that they had. Number one, you could say to make sacrifices. That's obvious but also to intercede in prayer. They were prayer warriors. They were defenders of the people. God's wrath was hanging over the heads of the people, and they were necessary to um, keep the wrath of God appeased and keep wrath out of the camp through the regular sacrifice and intercessory prayer of God. God, if they didn't do that job on the Day of Atonement and several other important festivals, God's wrath could descend upon the camp. The priests also maintained the tabernacle and all the associated elements, so they had a physical job as well. They had sort of the job of trustees in a way. They were trustees of the physical manifestations and elements of God's worship. They also had the job of teaching the people, and I think this one is often overlooked. The priests were supposed to be the teachers. By the time of, uh, of Jesus, there had been, you know, the, the priesthood had kind of neglected its duty in doing this. And you see the priests as some of the most corrupt in the time of Jesus. And you had different 
uh, factions arising after the exile and after the time of Ezra the scribe. Ezra uh, had, had taught the people and basically done his job as the priest. But um, subsequent priests just sort of allowed that to be shopped out to scribes and to Pharisees and to just different groups that were doing it. So, but it was primarily the priest's job to instruct the people about righteousness, to know the word, to administer the word. The priests often uh, also received offerings and donations from the people. Not that they were being worshipped themselves through the offering, but they were supposed to then take that offering before the Lord and present it to him. God didn't just um, uh, set up his worship system so that everybody just, you know, set, builds their own altar and sacrifices on it, although that was um, certainly possible to do, but there was also a prescribed element with the temple system that the priest, you're supposed to take this sacrifice to the priest, the priest would offer it on your behalf. This is all, again, designed to point to the Messiah. So we have make sacrifices, intercede in prayer, maintain the tabernacle and its elements, teaching the people, receiving offerings and donations. Two more things. They also judged the people, especially cases of ritual purity. Um, so you see that Jesus, and you might remember the story of Jesus saying, go to the priest and show him uh, your disease and um, show that you are clean. They would have to rule on uh, ritual holiness cases. And finally, oh, maybe not finally, but the last thing I thought of, number seven, to maintain the holiness of the camp overall. They were the referees. They were the, the guards of holiness in the camp. If something was um, bringing God's wrath down upon the camp spiritually, such as the case of the, um, the golden calf incident, for example, or... Uh, there are other ish incidents in Israel's history where, uh, like Phineas, the priest, uh, comes and defends the, um, the holiness of God in the case of adultery and there are many other cases like that where the priests were to make sure that God's wrath did not descend on the people just by uh, enforcing the law. So those are seven things that there could be others as well. But if you think about those seven things that we just went through, the Messiah ends up doing all of that. Those are the roles of the Messiah. Think about it. First of all, the sacrifice. He makes atonement through the sacrifice. He is the sacrifice, and he offers the sacrifice. Does the Messiah pray? Does he intercede for his people? Absolutely. John chapter 15 through 17, the great high priestly prayer, right? He's, he's doing his work as the high priest by praying for his people. Did Jesus maintain the purity of the camp? Absolutely, when he cleansed the temple. Did he teach the people? Of course. Did Jesus receive donations and offerings? Think about when the woman poured out the perfume on his feet, and he accepted that. That was an acceptable sacrifice. And judging cases, even, of ritual holiness. When the lepers came to Jesus and he healed them, and then he said, he didn't just send them on their way. He said, he said, go see the priest. He upheld the ritual system, the holiness of it. In all of these roles, this great high priest, Messiah, was sympathetic to the people. He was a perfect mediator on behalf of men. He was one of them. So knowing all of that, seeing all the Old Testament roles and the, the types and shadows, those things pointing ahead to the Messiah, the people should have been expecting one who would come and do all of these things the priest did, but he would also be sympathetic. He would be a perfect mediator because he was a man. I don't want to steal any of Dave's thunder in the next chapter. <laughs> but, but... We go, to, go ahead to chapter 5, verse 2. 5, verse 1 and verse 2. Just look at that briefly. You'll see where we're going. Every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. You know, there are some odd chapter, chapter breaks in Hebrews because really this is, you know, what we're going to see in chapter 5 next week is really a continuation of 
the argument we're looking at tonight. But the high priests are chosen from among men. That was the point. It had to be. If we go to Isaiah chapter 52, there's a very interesting passage here. Um, prefiguring the Messiah, predicting the Messiah. And we know, we know Isaiah 53 so well, right? Um, don't forget that Isaiah 53 begins in 52. Talking about odd chapter breaks. Isaiah 53 really begins in 52, verse 13. And here's how it starts. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed? And it goes on in the 53 that we know so well. But it really begins there. My servant shall act wisely. And in verse 15, he shall sprinkle many nations. The same word sprinkle there is the same word in Leviticus chapter 16, which is describing the priest on the Day of Atonement. And the priest would go and enter the Holy of Holies and take that blood of the sacrifice and sprinkle it onto the Ark of the Covenant. That's the exact same word, Hebrew word there. So we know from Isaiah 52 that this coming Messiah is a priest. And not just a priest, a high priest. Because only the, great, only the high priest on the Day of Atonement could go into that place. He will sprinkle the nations. He is going to die and atone for the world, for every nation. That's an amazing thought. There's no excuse, really, for the Hebrews to not see this, this, this greatest of all messianic prophecies, Isaiah 52 to 53, and not see right away that he is going to be a priest, a high priest. In Leviticus chapter 16, we mentioned, um, I think we know the story, but if we don't, that's good too. It's a good time to learn it. Leviticus, Le Le Leviticus 16 gives us some insight into this idea of, in Hebrews, when it says he passed through the heavenlies. So Leviticus chapter 16, if you'll turn there as well, just verse 1 through 4, you could obviously read the whole thing. <clears throat> Now, in the context of this is amazing, too. God is giving instructions on the Day of Atonement, how to expiate his wrath, how to take away his wrath, how to atone for sin, and, and, to, and to keep the wrath of God from falling on the camp of the people. The Lord, so verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron. As a reminder, saying, I am not to be approached in any fashion that you want. I am holy. When they drew near before the Lord and died, and the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat that is on the ark, so that he may not die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. But in this way Aaron shall come into the holy place with a bull from the herd for a sin offering and a ram for burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat and shall have the linen undergarment on his body and he shall tie the linen sash around his waist and wear the linen turban. These are the holy garments. He shall bathe his body in water and then put them on. Now I want to just stop there. We could obviously go on and talk about that. But look at the, the requirements for entry in the holy place. The person who passes in may not just appear. He has to be clean. He has to be properly dressed. He has to be 
pure. Now, taking a bath and putting on these clothes make Aaron pure? Maybe on the outside, but he's bringing his wicked heart in there, and I only say that because it's my heart. The Bible says that we're all wicked, but Aaron knows that. Aaron knew that as he's walking in. Imagine yourself, the high priest. You're walking in there outwardly. You're all clothed and white and and clean garments, and you're walking in there, and you're thinking, I can't clean my heart. God knows my heart. What did Isaiah say? I'm a man of unclean lips. What did Peter say in the boat? I'm a sinful man. Depart from me. They knew in the presence of the Lord. They knew that this was all outward. They needed to be clean inward. But even still, God says, approach. You are to come to me. You must come to me. And here's how you're going to do it. That's all a picture. It's all a shadow and a type of the one who would have to approach, would have to be clothed in perfect righteousness, in pure white linen, clean, no blemish. Because the baseline of entry to God's presence was death. And only through blood could God's wrath be taken away, propitiated and expiated. The washing, the clean clothes, those all symbolize regeneration. But even then, someone had to go first. <laughs> someone had to go first in, in, to, to, to make salvation possible. And that person had to be pure and spotless himself. You might know this story well, but they would, um, they would tie a rope around the high priest's waist. And they would even put little bells on his garment because the people outside would, you know, be afraid that he might die in the Holy of Holies. And then I'm not going in there to get the body. I've got to drag him out with a rope. If they, stopped, heard the, if they, if they stopped uh, hearing the bells jingling, they'd be like, well, I guess he wasn't prepared. God didn't accept his sacrifice and they would yank the body out. I wonder if that ever actually happened. So passing through, going back to Hebrews, passing through the heavenlies, this is, this is the idea. It's, it's, there's the, you know, the outer uh, holy place, and then there's the inner holy place, holy of holies. And you're passing through these levels of, of purity. And then there's the temple grounds, and outside there's the court of the Gentiles, court of the women. You're passing through these stages of greater and greater ritual purity to get to the holy of holies. Who can bridge the gulf between humans and God but God alone? Man cannot come to God. There's no way. But God came to man. And not only did God come to man, but he returned to God. That's the idea of passing through. It wasn't enough for God to just become a man. He needed to go back to God, to the Father. That's what Jesus is talking about when he says, you should rejoice that I'm going back to my Father. Because if I'm going back to my Father, that means he's accepting the sacrifice that I'm going to make, and he's going to bring you, my brothers, with me. That where I am, there you may be also, right? If Jesus just stayed on earth and lived a life as a mortal man and God didn't accept the sacrifice, we, we have no hope. But because he went away and he went to the right hand of the Father and sat down, because it was finished, because he passed through the heavenlies, we have hope. Our hope now, our salvation is in heaven with Christ. It's Colossians 3.3, 3, right? Man could not come to God, but God came to man and returned to God that he might bring man with him. So back in Hebrews chapter 4, that was our tour through the Old Testament idea of priesthood. We have two applications for this. 
No, before that, excuse me, before that, we need to talk about verse 15, then we'll get to the application, so mix it up a little bit here. But, but do pay attention to what it says in the end of 14, let us hold fast our confession. That's the first of the two let us, two commands. And then verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. He's tempted in every respect. If we go back to chapter 2, verse 17, it's, it's going to be really helpful for us to put these two sections together because you can see this is all one argument. He's not bouncing around. He is threading multiple threads through this book to make his argument. And in chapter 2, verse 17, it says, Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. Not that, you know, it was... Um, not that we deserve salvation, but that by the wisdom, it says in chapter 2, by the wisdom, it was fitting, verse 10, chapter 2, that Christ should do this. It was according to the wisdom that God established. So verse 17, therefore he had to, according to that wisdom, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. It's not enough that the priest is going to be faithful and do the sacrifices, but he needs to know and to feel what humans felt to make propitiation for the sins of the people. It was necessary in 18, for because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. That's really important to the author of Hebrews, is that they understand this is not just a priest who suffers for you as a sacrifice, but one who suffers with you as a companion, as a friend, as a brother. The high priest is a brother of the people. That was the whole point. Then again to chapter 4, verse 14 and 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. He's trusting that we understand this point by now. I do want to talk about being tempted in every respect. This is an interesting um, phrase that could potentially produce some problems, but we want to put all the Bible together and address it. What is it that he sympathizes with our weaknesses and is tempted in every respect as we are? What is it and what is it not? Well, we want to say weaknesses are not sins, first of all. He doesn't sympathize with our sin. Jesus doesn't have an ounce of sympathy for our sin. That's very important that we say. These days, the line between the word sin and the, and the idea of weakness or brokenness is being blurred way too much among Christians. You haven't sinned when you get sick. You haven't sinned if, if, you, if you fall down and break your ankle. You haven't sinned if you can't lift 150 pounds over your head. Those are weaknesses. Those aren't sins. Christ didn't have sins. He had weaknesses. He was human. He needed sleep. He needed food. He needed water. He was not, as some of the old heretics said, just appearing to be man. He was fully man. He laid aside his prerogatives of divinity by embracing humanity and understanding hunger and thirst and fatigue and all of those things. Those are weaknesses. He also, beyond that, he understood spiritual and emotional weaknesses. He experienced stress. You saw that in Gethsemane. He experienced sadness, loneliness, betrayal. Those are the weaknesses of humanity that he knew. In some mysterious way as well, you want to be really careful here, but in some mysterious, part of being human is, is experiencing time and experiencing the darkness of the future and not having the omniscient 
perspective that sees all things at all times. Now, Jesus didn't cease being God. I don't want to assert that. But part of being a human is as he's going in through Gethsemane, he knows now the hour has come. So now I'm, now I'm feeling sadness, grief, sorrow, holy anxiety, not unholy anxiety. I'm feeling the, the pressure, the burden of the upcoming on me. And it's not that he didn't know, but he was like a human. We, we walk with, with the darkness of the future in front of us. And he was fully human in that sense. <clears throat> so he sympathizes with our weakness by being fully human. We want to emphasize that. Now, what does it mean that he was tempted in every respect? And how do we square this with James chapter 1, verse 13, which says that God cannot be tempted? It's best to understand Jesus' temptation as of um, a real, true quality, but not the same as human temptation for one important reason. And that is that James goes on to tell us in that very passage where it says God cannot be tempted, that temptation happens to us, sinful humans, when our inward desires are drawn out. When the devil's able to latch on to something inside of our heart, or perhaps the devil is not directly involved with it and we just see the fruit we just see the, the, the thing that we desire and our own sinful hearts compel us to act and to give in to the temptation. Jesus' temptation was not like that at all. We want to be very, very careful there. When Satan came to tempt Jesus in Matthew and Luke 4, there was no appeal to any inward sinful desire whatsoever. I think Satan knew that, too. I think Satan knew there was no way that Jesus, the perfect God, was going to give in. The testing of Jesus in the desert demonstrated no desire or even capacity to sin, and that was the whole point. That God, through that temptation, that testing of Jesus, showed that he was incapable of being tempted. He would not give in. And yet, he was tempted. He was tested. The external, the outward um, act of temptation was given to him. The things were that we are drawn by, power, pride, lust, envy, pleasure, selfish ambition, all of those things were offered to Jesus. And so in every respect, in every category of sin, Jesus faced temptation the way we do. But it was not of the same quality. I hope that distinction makes sense. It's a, it's a tough distinction to understand, but it is an important one to make. He has been in every respect tempted as we are. There's no situation we can look at and say, Jesus never faced loneliness. Jesus never faced um, the temptation towards selfish ambition or pride. Jesus never faced giving in to desire. He faced those things. And so he can understand and he can sympathize with our weaknesses, not with our sin. He hates our sin. And that's what makes him the perfect mediator. There was no spot, no blemish in him as he went to God to offer the sacrifice. So knowing this and being encouraged by this, what two things are we then to do what is our command? <clears throat> First, it says, let us hold fast our confession. Hold secure what you have been taught and what you believe. Because the guarantor of that promise is forever resting in the heavens. Jesus has passed, right? Verse 14, he has passed through. He's not passing through the heavens right now. He's not working his way up. He's, it's done. It's over. It's finished. 
we can enter rest because, because Christ has entered that rest. Hold fast our confession. He's talking to the Hebrews and saying, hold fast to what you believe. They were, they were being pulled from all these directions, especially from their Jewish brothers, to return to the law and to the sacrifices, to return to the shadow and to reject the substance. And he's saying, because our high priest has gone through and torn that curtain from top to bottom, do not go back. Press onward. Don't go back to old covenant legalism that's hoping to produce righteousness. Those animals cannot do it. He's going to make that point much stronger later on by talking about those who, who look back, those who, who, who have tasted of this heavenly gift and tasted some of the benefits of the new covenant. If they go back, they're trampling the blood of Christ underfoot. They're, they're crucifying him all over again if you go back to the Old Testament law. Let's hold fast to our confession. What is our confession? It's the new covenant. It's the new covenant in his blood. That there is one mediator and one sacrifice and one baptism. And that's through faith in Jesus Christ. And we will not go back to try to earn it ourselves. And in a way, I want to I say this too as an aside, just a brief aside. There, there's, there are... There are views these days that say that the, the Jewish religion of the Old Testament um, was, was inherently corrupt and, and wrong and, and bad. And obviously what developed out of Judaism in the Old Testament that rejected Christ and set up a, a, a situation of a, a system of, of works righteousness and but that's, that's, you know, that's, that's evil, but that's not what the Old Testament law of Moses and what the prescribed law, you know, Psalm 119, the law of God is perfect, reviving the soul, because the law was supposed to lead us to Christ. It was to show us mercy. It was to show us that there was hope in the mediator. So any kind of system of Judaism that sets itself up as legalism, as works righteousness, is not biblical Judaism. Biblical Judaism is this. It's worshiping the Messiah. That's an aside. The word Jew is being confused a lot and saying the Jew, Jewishness uh, or Judaism was never supposed to be the goal. No, Judaism was the, was the, the guardian. You know, the, the religion of Yahweh was the guardian leading us to the religion of Yahweh's um, son, the Messiah. So, much more we could say about that. So let us hold fast that confession. Let's, let's complete the Old Testament by accepting the new covenant, by believing in our Messiah. And let us then draw near, verse 16. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. You might know this verse. It might be one of the most encouraging to you. It should be. Those Hebrews who, you know, those high priests and those priests who stared ahead at the Holy of Holies, you can imagine his heart on the Day of Atonement was racing like a race car. <laughs> Am I doing it right? Did I forget something? Did I miss something? Am I obeying him perfectly? They were terrified. They knew people had died in that room. Was the blood of countless sacrifices of animals, did, did that remain on the Ark of the Covenant, staining it for hundreds of years? It seemed that way. They went in and saw the blood everywhere. It's a terrifying thought, but let us draw near with confidence. Why? Because that curtain is torn open. What is the grounds for our confidence? That Christ is one of us. That he's our brother. If your brother were the president of the United States, you might feel at greater liberty to just walk into the Oval Office. You might have to get by security first. <laughs> but you certainly wouldn't feel like you didn't belong. Especially when we have a brother who loves us so much. Let us draw near with confidence. I think about the 
the hymn, And Can It Be, right? Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Boy, that's some, that's some bold language there. I'm barging into that room and I'm claiming that crown myself. Knowing it's not because I, you know, I inherently belong there, but because I'm commanded to. This is the Holy Spirit. This is not just the author of Hebrews. This is the Holy Spirit telling you, come on in boldly. You don't need to knock. And as I say that, I'm so ashamed of how little I often want to go to the throne of grace. I don't even want to be there, even though the door is open. There's so many things I'd rather do. And yet we have a high priest who sympathizes with, who understands us, and we are growing more and more in our, our faith and our love for God. And so we, we take heart knowing that, especially in our time of need, it says in 16, we can draw near to the throne of grace. I love that it's called the throne of grace. His throne for us is characterized not by judgment, not by severe authority or even majesty, but by grace. This is the place to receive it. That was the mercy seat on top of the ark. As, as terrifying and forbidding as it was, it was called the mercy seat. This is where you'll find mercy. And I want to close with this. This is um, a, a, an exhortation to also see ourselves as priests. We have the great high priest, but we are also called a kingdom of priests, a nation of priests. I keep going back to that in my head. We will turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Since we have a great high priest and we ourselves are priests, we follow him in his example. He comforts us. He intercedes for us. What do we then do for others? 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 through 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in affliction, in any affliction, with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If you, if you contextualize it right, you can say the goal of Christianity is, is to be comfortable. <laughs> you got to be careful with that statement. But it's to, to receive comfort in your suffering. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. He's hitting it again and again and again. He's saying suffering has a purpose. There's no such thing as meaningless, random suffering. That's what the world wants you to believe. That's what the Satan wants you to believe. But we are put through trials so that we can then comfort others with the comfort that we receive. It's designed to be passed on and communicated to others. Psalm 103, 14 says, He knows our frame. He remembers we are dust. And not only does he know our frame, but he shares our frame. Even now, he is human, flesh and blood in the heavenlies, having passed through. Our great high priest ever lives to make intercession. We will see that in Hebrews chapter 7 and 5, verse 5. He ever lives to make intercession for us. What do we then do? We turn around and we intercede for others. We, com we comfort others in their suffering because we know what it's like and because, um, because it's all for a purpose. It's all for his glory. Let's pray.